It's difficult for me to say this, but maybe it's time to swallow my pride. For me to stop being so pedantic. This screen tells me, for more information, check out the links below. And the link below is New Player Guide. Now I know I should click it because I'm a new player and this is trying to help me, but the reviewer in me just doesn't want to. My issue is a well-designed game will teach you its processes and mechanics through emergent gameplay. It will introduce a mechanic, let you use it, then another mechanic, and then let you use that, and then combine them. Repeat until all mechanics are experienced and understood. I've got a second channel called Josh Drive Plays where I made a whole video on how a good tutorial works. So my issue with the new player guide button is you're offloading the intro tutorial work onto a text dump or a video dump and not having to actually design the gameplay for it, but maybe I expect too much. Dungeons and Dragons Online came out in 2006, so maybe I should swallow my pride click the button, read the new player guide. I mean, if I don't, I have only myself to blame, right? The offer was there, so you know what? I'll take it. I'll trust you, game. I'm ready to read. Teach me your ways. Make me the best new player you can make me. So I click that link. Stunning. Just an absolutely stunning start. The new player guide link does not work. You know, this is prophetic because the game clearly has no interest in gaining new players and this isn't the only broken link. In fact, my 10 hours into Dungeons & Dragons Online showed me broken hyperlinks, tooltips for items just not showing up, the wrong map icons flashing for quests, server lag, more server lag, extreme server lag, overwhelming build quantity, quests that can only be finished with cash shop items, and many, many copy-pasted hallways filled with many, many identical boxes. And yet, despite the absolute mountain of small issues and design mistakes that plague every minute of this game. At its very core, Dungeons & Dragons Online might be one of the most fun and varied online adventure experiences I've had in a long time. There's no denying it's a broken, expensive, buggy mess, but it's also an undeniably enjoyable adventure game. So welcome, I'm Josh Drive Hayes, and this is Worst MMO Ever, a series where I play every MMO I can find in a journey to find the worst. Drop a like on the vid or sub to the channel for more MMO stuff. Ring the bell for all the future notifications, and as usual, a massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon, Twitch, and YouTube who keep the channel alive. More information on how you can support at the end. For now, let's gather our party and venture forth. Let me start with some personal context. I love the Dungeons & Dragons franchise. I love the old pulp fantasy stories. I love the video games. I'm a massive fan of swords and sorcery high fantasy adventure. I'm the dungeon master for the role-playing group Session Zero and recently built a physical tavern to host our adventures in. Shameless plug, channel link in the description. I even went to London for the red carpet premiere of the Honor Among Thieves film, managed to meet Hugh Grant in the Tower of London. In fact, my second channel, Josh Drive Plays, has a full replay of Baldur's Gate, one of my my favourite games of all time. I'm telling you this to be totally open about my love for Dungeons & Dragons, and yet I never tried Dungeons & Dragons online, so I'm actually interested about this one. Unfortunately, there are some early warning signs. Bad design, which makes me think, oh, this is gonna lack so much polish and be so rough around the edges. Like how the user agreement box has a horizontal scroll bar despite not needing it, and how if you've played Lord of the Rings online, you can't play this. Right, this is actually a major issue and requires some explaining. This is one of the most baffling roadblocks of database design I've ever seen. I tried to sign up for Dungeons & Dragons online and it says that email is already in use, and that's kind of correct, it is in use for Lord of the Rings Online. You see, Dungeons & Dragons Online is currently produced by Standing Stone Games, and they also produce Lord of the Rings Online. And when you sign up for either of these games, you need a general Standing Stone game account, and then an account for the specific game you want to play. But you cannot use the same email for both games. This issue has been known about for years and is pasted all over Reddit, the d and forums, and the Steam page. Please fix this, because this is mind-numbingly dumb. So new email used. Launching the game throws you straight into a full-screen cutscene with no subtitles, which irks me because having subtitles on by default helps people who play with sound low or are hard of hearing. The intro movie itself is the finest CGI mid-2000s can buy, showing us a robot and his party raiding a dungeon. Classic fantasy stuff. But of course, even launching an intro movie is something that Dungeons & Dragons Online manages to get wrong. I showed you the full-screen replayed movie as I found in the options. What it actually looks like when you launch is this. For some reason, they only use a quarter of the screen and you have to change the resolution manually. And now on to character creation. You've got four styles of character. Melee focused, mage focused, special, which is more specific gameplay styles like support, and iconic, which are high level pre-built characters you can start as to save some time, but you have to buy these. And we'll look at the shop in depth later. While building my character, the music also just stops. 
don't know why. Maybe the devs played Hero Plus and really liked it when the game did that. So far, lots of small issues. I'll note this down and come back to it later. So building a character goes overall style, class within that style, path within that class, and one of the game's greatest strengths and its greatest weaknesses is just how many builds are possible and viable. And the best thing about the strengths of any build is they're normally situational and can excel when in a team. A cleric can indeed heal wounds, but they aren't just a heal stick because heal wounds also hurts undead creatures. Rogues are stealthy, but they're also the only class that can find secret passages and pick locks, so you want to take one with you. And if you don't like your build, there's a reincarnation system where you reset to level 1, rebuild and go again, keeping some benefits from your past life. So while Dungeons & Dragons Online can be played entirely solo, teaming up is the best way to balance the weaknesses of your build, and your build doesn't have to be permanent, so we'll look at the reincarnation system later. In another lovely touch, each class has a solo viability tag. Now I can't find the seduce bartender skill in the bard list, so plan A is out the window, on to plan B a dragonborn truth bringer paladin, and we start the game washed up on a beach after a shipwreck. Just like Neverwinter Online, and Albion Online, and Path of Exile, and New World, and Age of Conan, and EverQuest 2. You know, I assumed the most dangerous role in any RPG world would be something like Dragon Hunter or being a level 1 bandit, but apparently it's Sailor. I guess in Fantasyland you either die a quaint forest village start or live long enough to wash up on the beach start. Game starts, WASD movement, spaces jump, and the narration audio immediately overlaps with the talking NPC. You find yourself you waking on a shore Speak of flotsam. Me. Memories of a large white dragon striking your ship ah, you're awake. come flooding Oi, back. You ain't undead, are you? A and D are turn, which I immediately remap to strafe as nature intended, and holding right click locks the camera behind you, and left click attacks. So D&Do actually has rudimentary action combat many years before most games were doing this. Terror, the king of action combat, God rest its soul, came out in 2011. D&Do came out in 2006. We chat to this rogue, he says follow him, and some little tooltip pops up on the right hand side. We get given a sword and told to open the inventory, and the inventory is minute. This is an issue with running older games on modern high resolution monitors, you can just lean closer and squint. I try to find the upscale UI slider, but the only scale slider is for the text above NPCs and objects' heads. You cannot change the scale of this UI. Please make that possible, because it is tiny. But it's okay, because the D&D O wiki does have a solution to increase the scale of the UI. Simply decrease the resolution of the rest of the game. I wish I was joking. Thankfully, the keys are super easy to rebind and the map is serviceable, so with our new sword equipped, we bravely dispatch some dangerous barrels and then my urge to leap to my death is stifled by this massive invisible wall. We're told to talk to Selenus and sent into this cave, and this is a dungeon, so we get the dungeon menu. Choose your difficulty, solo, easy, medium, hard, or reaper, and each dungeon has these options and you unlock harder modes by completing the previous, meaning you can just grind dungeons. We get an anti-death spell cast on us, which is a lovely in-universe way of making sure the player doesn't die during the tutorial, but also leaves me questioning, if an anti-death spell exists, why isn't it the first and only spell anyone ever learns? Climb down this ladder because the fall damage is quite substantial, and hold left click to swing your sword wildly. Our party then gets ambushed, and thankfully the AI can hold their own. So behold, combat. There are more of them up there. Stay alert. The righteous smite you! Sawagin wretches, are you scared of me? Come down and fight! I was assuming the intro enemy would be a kobold or a goblin, something more quintessential traditional D&D, but they are the Sahawagin, a race of fish people, which is interesting because I have a Sahawagin model sat on my desk. Didn't expect that. Physically it feels quite floaty as your weapon just passes through the enemy, but the visual feedback of sparks and damage numbers and the audio feedback of fantastic sound effects are doing a lot of heavy lifting to make this combat quite enjoyable. After we've killed all the enemies, we need a key for this door, and that means swimming. Swimming is pretty easy to control, and your extremely limited breath meter means you're never underwater for long, and if your breath runs out, you just slowly lose health. But because this is a Dungeons & Dragons game, there is of course a potion or spell of water breathing available in the future. So we grab the key, and the voice acting between the party is okay-ish. The vast majority of voice acting in this game is uncredited, but interesting touch, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, the original creators of Dungeons & Dragons, actually both supplied voice work for a later adventure. 
which is quite cool. Find our first moon shrine. These are rest points and refill health, and you can use one every 15 minutes, and in longer dungeons they are essential. The rogue disables a trap, which both introduces us to traps and class-specific abilities, which is nice, and then we kill some fish priests and loot a chest, and in a party all your loot is pre-rolled, but solo you just get everything. Now, item tooltips are overwhelming. Thankfully, most of it you won't need or remember. And now the search skill, which is one of the hotbar skills every class gets. You just have a good look around, and if there's a hidden passage or doorway, you will spot it. Rogues have a higher search skill. So we escape the cave, choose a reward, and some weapons have penalties for using because we're not proficient in them. And okay, let's just discuss this. DDO was developed with a loose connection to the 3.5 edition rule set, which itself is a revised version of the third edition rule set. D&D players will know that 3.5 offered an immense amount of customization and freedom over character builds and is still a fan favorite to this day, with many long-term D&D people preferring 3.5 because of the sheer depth and freedom that it brings. But depth and freedom often comes at the cost of confusion and intimidation, and this is definitely true for brand new players. Consider D&D 3.5 similar to Morrowind Wind and the current 5th edition similar to Skyrim. The more modern streamlined editions have indeed sold better and have broader appeal, but you've lost some of the character and the charm of variety, and this is on full display in Dungeons & Dragons Online. Now I love being pedantic when it comes to rules, I'm a Magic the Gathering player. Some games need extreme pedantry, but I'm also aware that liberties need to be taken when it comes to games or films to streamline the process or to make the gameplay experience enjoyable. Look, when watching the D&D film, I had to fight the immense urge to lean over and whisper, well, actually an owlbear is a monstrosity, not a beast, so the druid wouldn't be able to wild shape into them, and I don't know how many times they're wild shaping, but they're clearly not 20th level. But I didn't do this, because sometimes the rule of cool trumps the rule as written. The problem with DDO is not how deep it is, because depth and customization within a game is great. The problem is it's a gaping chasm of depth with no easy route to descend into. Instead of having an easily accessible walkway spiraling into the murky depth that new players can gently stroll down at their own pace, or abseiling ropes that experienced MMO players can clip into and leap down in stages, it just throws you into the gaping more of potential and kind of hopes you figure it out before you hit the bottom and die. But remember, you can't go and check the new player guide because it doesn't work. So welcome to Korthos, there's a dragon problem and the island is infested with Sahuagin, so it's time to be a local hero. Press M to open the local map, and you might want to zoom out so you click the little minus symbol and get to the entire continent. These are the two levels of zoom, either just a little bit too close, or literally the rest of the world. Thankfully, the local map does show us important NPC locations, and the quest log shows the local quests, quest giver, hand in location, there's even a handy dandy looking for group button so you can find a team. I like this. So let's just talk about how DDO works, because it's a strange combination of designs from different MMOs. The build variety of EverQuest, the map layout and party mechanics of Guild Wars 1, dungeon farming with difficulties from World of Warcraft, and prestige from Call of Duty. DDO doesn't have a massive shared overworld, instead you have safe hub zones like Korthos Island or the Harbour City. In these zones you can see other players, find vendors, banks, shops and quest givers. Then you've got adventure zones which are connected via travel gates, these work like Guild Wars 1, they're zones accessible from the safe hub and before you leave a hub, if you team up with other players, you'll travel to the adventure zone with them. If you go into an adventure zone solo, you will never see another player, like an overland instance. And then you've got dungeons which can be found in both safe hubs and within adventure zones themselves, and when you start a dungeon you choose the difficulty you want to play it. The design of only seeing other players in hub zones does give weight to the argument that DDO is not really a massively multiplayer online game, but instead an online adventure RPG, but that's just splitting hairs over a definition people don't agree on anyway. So with the game focused on adventure zones and dungeons, it's a very journey focused experience. The end game does exist with high level content, but this is not the focus. Indeed, the expansions that you you can buy for Dungeons & Dragons Online are in the form of either extra adventure zones or plot lines which include new zones and dungeons or massive endgame expansions. And the expansions themselves are all listed by recommended levels, so a low level character still has content aimed specifically at them. But what's the point of a low level adventure zone when you can just level past it if you're going to rush to max level and then grind the best stuff? Well, when you reach the higher levels, you can choose to reincarnate, and you need a premium object to do this, and the system has various layers to it, but basically, you reset your character to a lower level, gain a few minor buffs every time you do this, but 
but also suffer an experience gain penalty for every new life you have. And when you reincarnate, if you reincarnate the correct way, you can completely redo your class so you can try out new builds, new styles. And this is why even in low level areas, I saw so many players. Because once players reach end game, they're rewarded for reincarnating and leveling through in a different way. This also means that new content can be aimed at, say, level five to eight, even if the majority of the player base is higher because those players will just reincarnate and play through the new adventure. And I really like this system. It does a huge amount of work at keeping every level and every adventure relevant, and there's very little dead content. It also means as a new player, you're much more likely to find someone, likely an experienced player, running the low level content that you're doing, willing to help you. So how do you get the new content? Well, you've got to use the shop. So let's dive in. The DDO shop is quite expensive and uses DDO points, a premium currency you can either buy or earn in game. And then you can spend that to buy either small individual adventures or adventure zones for points. Now, in a nice touch, just like Lord of the Rings Online, you can play the game and earn the points, so play long enough and you can just unlock a lot of things. There is also a monthly subscription which unlocks all the extra stuff, apart from the massive expansion packs, which have full box prices themselves. But if you spend even a dollar in the store, you get permanently upgraded from free to premium. And it's important we understand that the three stages go free, premium, VIP. So premium is like a constant small reward for spending anything. But what about VIP? What does that get you? Hey, look, we can click here to see how much VIP costs. So I click here, except you can't click there because your hyperlinks go to the wrong page or an error page. Please spend a day working on your goddamn site map. The only way to find VIP prices is to Google it and go directly there. And there's a handy dandy chart to see the differences between VIP, premium and free. Now, interestingly, the Dungeons and Dragons online shop cannot be accessed accessed directly from the website, but it also can't be accessed within the game client. Instead, you have to use the game client to launch the website which contains the shop, which is needlessly complex. The issue here is I both love and hate different aspects of this monetization method. I love how you can only buy the adventures you want to go on, and I hate how you still have to have a proprietary currency to do it. I love how there is a ton of cosmetics, but I hate how you can't see how they look on an in-game model before buying them. I hate how there's experience boosts in the shop, but I love how the game isn't about endgame, so these are kind of pointless. Now, there's no ignoring it, the shop is expensive, but one saving grace of Standing Stone games is they do give away a lot of stuff for free quite often. Now, about two weeks before I made this video, the code Dungeon Crawl was active. It's not active anymore. It gave people a ton of adventure packs, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to try it anyway. And it worked. So the new player guide link doesn't work, but the free stuff code lasts two weeks longer than you say it's going to. Sometimes I guess they mess up in your favour. Randall tells us about spirit binding. When you die, you'll just return to your bound place. Then Cregan offers us a quest, but the game warns us we should finish Corthos Island first. And I appreciate this. One design choice I dislike in MMOs is when new high-level content is added to a low area and a new player doesn't know that it's new content, accepts it, and gets whisked away to some disconnected high-level area. It's nice to see designers reminding players there is a suggested path but not forcing you to take it. Head into a crypt and try out some more of my hotkey skills. Armor break, trip, paladin smite, the usual. So we fight some cultists, and I like how you can see the dice rolls for your attacks shown on the right hand side. We then get told that swords do slashing damage, which is good against fleshy stuff, and maces do crushing damage, which is good against crunchy stuff. So there's an element of attack style choice, and later I discover this does matter quite a lot because the bonuses are substantial. There's more stats and skills than I could ever even begin to memorize, so like any good dungeon master, I just knowingly smirk and start rolling dice, hoping everyone assumes that I'm using my encyclopedic knowledge of the game to craft a perfectly balanced encounter and not just making things up as I go. Remember, players roll dice for the numbers and dungeon masters roll them for the clicky clacky sound they make. Someone did once ask me how much I plan out my adventures and I said, you know how you can set view distances in video games? Well, I DM on the lowest settings. I open every hotbar, you have 20 of them, and then discover the controller menu has something called FPS mode. So I try it and suddenly I'm wearing an Xbox 360 headset and telling the cleric how bad their mum is in bed. So all down here I open the dungeon map and this is something I must praise DDO for. The adventure zones are expansive and the dungeons have so many optional paths and objectives and hidden secrets you can spend longer finding all the hidden bits 
than actually following the critical path of the dungeon. For example, this is a dungeon map, and the sheer amount of extra rooms is just mind-boggling. Journeying through a DDO dungeon or quest zone without a guide does genuinely evoke those nostalgic feelings of actually adventuring. And after playing for three days, I think that's one of the game's greatest strengths. I praised Lord of the Rings for how it feels like Middle-earth. Well, Dungeons & Dragons Online feels like a classic D&D adventure. It just happens to be online. I can imagine that getting three or four friends together to play the game at the same time would be really good fun, everyone just figuring things out as they go, and I'll probably try and do that. It feels like a balance between the story focus of Baldur's Gate, the hack and slash focus of Dark Alliance, the overwhelming build variety of the 3.5 book, but unfortunately has just enough bad design and bugs sprinkled on top to keep it from being mainstream appealing. It's a phenomenally good adventure game system framework contained within a very flawed and buggy overall game experience. I also discover you can hold shift to block with my shield. It's probably worth telling players you can do this, and while blocking, your move becomes a little jump forward or backwards or to the sides, and this will matter later when the projectiles start flying. We light up three crests by finding three switches, take down a boss, and I get a better shield. At least I think it's better, there's a lot of text, and it takes a long time to compare. When you finish your dungeon, this little box just says finish, so you click this and you're teleported back to wherever you started, which is nice. I seek out the Paladin Trainer and spend my earned enhancement point. I have four separate skill trees I can advance through, some of which can be switched out for others, but mostly you have a racial tree, a class tree, and two extra styles. The Slayer of Evil tooltip also says I gain bonuses for my favoured weapon, and it takes me quite a while to find out that my favoured weapon is Longsword. This is another example of extremely deep with no easy access to the information. Oh hey, the game has climbing too. I really hope they use the 3D environment to add in verticality and exploration into quests. Spoiler, they do. Protecting this crystal means wave defense, and I discover items have a durability bar, the blue bar at the bottom of their tooltip, and when an item breaks, you can fix it at any vendor. But every time you fix an item, there is a small chance it will be permanently damaged and reduce its overall durability. So you either need to fix it using items from the cash shop, which don't do this, or gather multiple of the same weapon. I do like the weapon set boxes, where you can set a main hand and an offhand weapon, and then double click to auto equip that combo. This dude Linus wants our help, doesn't even offer us any tech tips, and now our map has a handy dandy arrow showing where your current selected quest needs you to go, in this case it's the tavern. While in a tavern you will heal faster. More dungeons and, quick note, free and premium players, that's players who spent at least a dollar, only unlock higher difficulty dungeon options by completing the previous. VIP monthly paying players have access to all difficulties instantly. We search some houses for some magical MacGuffins, and here's a nice touch. When the mouse cursor is unlocked, holding right click locks the camera but you can toggle locked and action camera, and now holding right click unlocks the cursor, so it's the same but opposite, which makes switching from combat to clicking items super easy. We get to the end of this dungeon and oh, a tile puzzle. I love it when games have puzzles, so we spin the tiles to fill a pipe up and unlock the door. I wonder if they'll expand on this tile puzzle design later with more options and more risk. Spoiler, they do. Hand in the quest and get called the local hero, which is nice. Another great point of DDO is you're not the savior of the world, at least not at the start. You're just a local hero doing local hero stuff. Small scale, but personal and relatable. The bartender tells us there's a traitor on the island working with the Sahawagin, so we swap places with them and wait for the traitor, and my god, it's Jacoby! And this would have a lot more emotional impact if we knew who Jacoby was. So we fight the traitor, search the sewers, kill some more fish, and then accept a quest, which makes me roll my eyes so far back I can see my brain. You need to deliver a bottle of grog to an NPC. Who sells grog? Not the tavern? Not a pirate? No, the only place to get grog is the DDO cash shop and it costs four DDO coins, which thankfully I've now built up. So it doesn't cost me anything, but it's so damn immersion breaking to be told you can only finish this quest by opening the cash shop. You even get an email that lets you know you've bought the item, which breaks the immersion even more. And you know this was the choice of some high up executive that said, hey, put a quest in there where players have to open the cash shop just so they know where it is. But the worst part about this cash shop quest, once you've accepted it, you cannot abandon it, and it will take up space in your quest log until you finish it. We get sent to find Lars on the island somewhere, and this is our first exploration into the combat zone, and the invisible walls no longer exist, so I now do genuinely accidentally jump off a cliff. Thankfully, I land in some water and discover a steam pipe, and this is part of the Corthos Island Explorer task. See? 
totally meant to do it. So we explore the island some more, find some more quests and some more dungeons, and this enemy runs ahead to ring a gong and alert other enemies, which means you can actually use the stealth mechanic to sneak past them. But I'm a dragonborn in metal armor. I'm about as stealthy as the Pinkertons. If you're watching this video in the future, there is context for that joke. You may need to go back and research. Here's a super cool set piece where you ring a gong twice and it breaks the slab of ice covering the floor, letting you jump down and explore some more. Then there's even more puzzles, switches, doors, and this bit, a ladder going underwater, which if you swim too close to, you'll automatically grab onto. The issue is you're underwater, which means you're drowning and your ladder climbing speed is way slower than your swimming speed. So design suggestion, don't let players grab ladders underwater they'll die. We now get info on damage numbers. Each weapon has a base damage, elemental damage, and then maybe additional skill damage. And purple numbers means you're hitting high, orange is normal, and yellow is bad. And if you're hitting yellow, the enemy either has a resistance to the weapon you're using, or you're not skilled with the weapon you're equipped with. Take down a spider boss, and now we need to freeze this sleeping giant. But they're behind a locked door, and we freeze them by arming some ice spray traps. And to do this, you need to complete another puzzle, except this time, the movable tiles spill over the edge of the raised section, so you're working in 3D. This is a lovely progression from the puzzle earlier. I wonder if they find even more variations on this puzzle. Spoiler! They do! Our reward for the quest is a helmet, but designing helmets to fit the Dragonborn race is clearly too hard, so you don't get any graphical changes. Nice to see the cult temples are wheelchair accessible. Everyone should be able to worship reality-destroying beings from another plane if they want to. We descend into more dungeons and encounter more traps. There's even a magical barrier puzzle with crystals and valves to open, and I have to say, the highlight of the adventure so far, the thing that really cements this as quintessential D&D, is how every dungeon has a DM narrate the adventure as you go. The doorway ahead has been boarded up. Oddly, the work looks very recent. A magical barrier humming with compressed energy resolutely blocks your path. You hope you can find a way to disable it somewhere. I see jets of some alchemical compound coat these humming canid power crystals in a hard protective layer. You also notice several valves of various sizes spread around the room. Upon turning the valve, you hear a definite alteration in the pitch of the hiss as the gas struggles to flow around your obstruction. As the last crystal shatters, the hum of power slowly fades into a heavy silence. Oh no, the Sawagan found me! Suddenly the air shimmers with devourer magic. The Sahagin have followed you in and are attacking. He feels life is in your hands. Go now. Tell Ursa to hold the barricade just a little longer. Then meet Amalgam at the base of Misery's Peak when you're ready. With Hayton finally persuaded to help, the people of Korthos might finally win their struggle. Find Lars, defend him from Sahawagin. He agrees to help the village, so we return with news of his aid, and this gets me a cape. And in a cool touch, the cape is enchanted with the Shield of Faith spell, and you can use it once per day. But this doesn't mean actual real time days, it's once every now and again. I never managed to figure out the exact time. You drag the cloak into your hotbar and use it from there. I like armor having spells on it, feels like you're constructing a magical mech suit. So far, for a game made in 2006, the graphics have really impressed me, especially this floating grass. I like to believe the grass is stubborn and has remained stationary and the island has slowly sunk. You know, there's a definite old-school charm to the old graphics and flatter textures. I just think too often games justify outdated and bad as nostalgic and classic, when the reality is you can keep a nostalgic and comfy retro look and feel while having the actual systems and mechanics behind the scenes be smooth and responsive. So we head off to a cave to meet Lars and the rest of the group to stop the Sahawagin and go and find the dragon. You're here! Come, there isn't much time! That, Lars, is what she said. Charge into the icy cavern, and this place is actually impressive scale-wise. Lots of locked doors and button puzzles, which all stack together and make this giant icicle shoot magical beams of light to whatever door we unlocked last. So we navigate through this massive ice cave and eventually find the dragon. Unfortunately, our old friend the Invisible Wall is back, so we can't jump over and start fighting it, which is a real shame. So instead, we push further into the cave and try and find the controlling force behind the Sahawagin aggression. So while we're exploring, let's just have a read of some reviews. Broken game. 
four quest that I poured hours into all bugged out and could not be completed in the last week. Add to that the horrendous lag at all times and this is a game best avoided. Game is fine if you get the free content code during the promotions, but two things. One, don't play on Steam, download the client from DDO websites, the Steam version barely works. And two, the drop rate in this game is absolutely atrocious, so good luck if you play solo. I'm not a huge MMORPG guy, but I am a fan of D&D. The scaling or UI graphics hurt my eyes in a way that isn't exactly pleasant. The controls are wonky, and I find myself attacking instead of picking up items or pulling levers. It feels very easy to accidentally ruin your character by picking a bad option, despite it all. Hearing the narrator give brief descriptions as you approach certain zones or story beats. Having NPCs that give more than just bare bones quest details and the overall aesthetic being D&D with friends but it isn't rude to bully the DM makes this a good time. Despite its numerous faults, this game is a fun time. Probably the closest MMO you will find to tabletop D&D. Right now they have a promo code Dungeon Crawl where you get a ton of pay to play content for free. Would highly recommend checking out. Game's close to being 20 years old. Played in 06 on launch day and it felt kind of janky even then. Prioritize some graphical UI and gameplay overhauls already. A fun MMO with the best character builder theory crafting I have come across. It is also a pay to win cash grab. There are microtransactions for just about everything in the game. Gear, consumables, hirelings, repairs, skills and ability upgrades, cosmetics and pretty much anything else in the game you can pay real money for. If you don't feel like going to the casino, D&D has you covered in the form of re-rolling chest loot or your daily prize for real money. I have 1600 hours in this game so please listen to my words. This game has a heart and soul beyond any other MMO currently available. Its only flaw is how unfamiliar it can be to newcomers. Don't be afraid to ask for help. 17 hours of playtime, hit level four and then paywalled out of the game. Can't hold more than 100,000 gold pieces on your character, but the bank to deposit your gold costs you $10 to unlock. So at this point, if your inventory is full, you're screwed. You can't sell anything because of the gold carry cap and you can't keep doing quests because your inventory is full and you can't offload gold because you have to pay real dollars for a bank. This is the worst game that I love. To double check that bank one, I went to the bank when I got to the first main city and it's wrong. You have 20 bank slots as a free player and can buy more. I also like how this door is labelled Cultist Base because if I was running a cult, the first thing I would do is label our hideout. Fight through the ritual chamber, kill this summoned ice flenser and go into the final room and find the truth. The dragon isn't evil, they're battling for mental domination against a mind flayer. Old DM secret, no matter what adventure your players go on, it's always a mind flayer. We destroy this crystal focus and the dragon wins the mental battle and freezes the mind flayer. This calms the Sahawagin down and when we leave the snow on the island has now stopped, which is a lovely visual representation of mechanical advancement. All in all, this was a lovely little intro section with a nice, enjoyable story, and we're told a world of adventure awaits in Stormreach, so we set sail. Stormreach Harbour is pretty grand, there's even a druid entrance right at the start, and I think this is an adventure zone for later, so I'll come back here then. The harbour itself has a lot of NPCs working, a crane moving boxes, a passenger transport ship flying through the air, it's a delight to look at. I collect a ton of local quests and feel like I'm actually a low-level adventurer in an established city, slowly rising up through the ranks. It's lovely, the low power power level has a very grounded feel to it. If you have the quest list and your map both open, selecting a quest makes the correct icon flash, either the dungeon entrance or the NPC to hand in, and this makes navigation really easy, so I go and sort out a kobold problem. And this actually needs you to climb over boxes, so it's not a pointless mechanic. d and actually has platforming. So I explore all around, unlock an additional spider section of this dungeon, which gives me some potions, but I do end up backtracking because the switches I needed to find blend in with the wall that aren't marked on any map. Eventually we kill Blood Knuckle, the leader of the gang, get a better sword, but it's level 2 and I'm still level 1. Oh yeah, you level really slowly, another example of journey over destination. Which I like, because being level 1 hasn't prevented me from being given an interesting narrative and lots of abilities to use. However, the game never actually explains how to level up because it hates new players. Just go and speak to your class trainer. I spent some time in the city doing quests and I learned three things. First, everyone in the city owns a warehouse. Secondly, every warehouse is infested with kobolds. And third, they've actually done a really good job of varying the quest mechanics. Even though they all use roughly the same map, this one needs me to find 10 gems inside boxes, so I'm smashing boxes. This one needs me to find items within a time limit. This one needs me to kill three leaders. This one needs me to not kill three leaders. And others need me to lure enemies to a certain location. There's a lot of variety in these very similar halls. One quest seems a bit harder. 
the captives. So I ask for help in general chat and I team up and the adventure zone is large and the colour palette is lovely. However, the orc enemies are beyond me, so I die very fast. Now, if you're in a team and your partner can revive you, as in they have the skill and a revive kit, you'll just get up there. But my partner doesn't, so you now have three choices. Use a revival item from the cash shop, spend a spirit shard, which is a premium item to get up, or fail the dungeon and return to town. So I'll try this dungeon again later. I revive, but I have forgot to update my revive point, and now we're back on Korthos. You know, maybe I should finish Korthos entirely first. I've not explored all of it or found any of the rare boss spawns, so I just quest. And while questing, I do my best to gather information. DDO is very much supported by old school traditional forums, and while there's a wiki, there's a lot of gaps. I'd lump Dungeons and Dragons Online in with what I'd call the middle class of MMOs, and I'll make a full vid explaining this soon, but basically, middle class MMOs are games which aren't part of the big five, Warcraft, Final Fantasy, Elder Scrolls, Guild Wars and RuneScape, but they also aren't dead. The middle class of MMOs are the ones your average gamer may not have heard of, but the more enfranchised MMO player will, but likely haven't actually played. MMOs which do have a stable player base and see enough income to comfortably exist, like Lord of the Rings Online, DDO, Guild Wars 1, Neverwinter, EverQuest, Star Wars The Old Republic, Wizard 101, the list goes on. They're games with enough positives that the player base can enjoy them, but just enough flaws, just enough mistakes, and just enough negativity to put off the majority of players. I've explained before that every hurdle or stumbling block in any process is a quit moment for someone. Every time someone comes up against any level of adversity, there is a small percentage chance they will quit right there. And these middle class MMOs have so many small quit moments. The email issue, the broken hyperlinks, the learning curve, the shop quest. The foundation they're built on is good, and for those who can look past the flaws and push past the quit moments, they're rewarding. But my god, you've got to get past a lot of quit moments. The strength of these middle class MMOs is often the player base tends to know that they're not world dominating, so the long term players stick around for fun. When your game is super massive worldwide successful, being the best tends to come with a certain level of respect and seniority and authority, but being the best in a game that only has 20 to 50,000 players? doesn't carry as much social prowess, so they play it for fun. Long-term players know that new players need to be taught how to stick around, and so they're normally quite inviting. We hunt down a necromancer, solve an underwater lever puzzle, which is a lovely combination of water and puzzles, and avoid this spike floor, which has a very questionable hitbox. I then try to use a shop and find that you just stack up everything you want to sell and sell all in one go, which is super easy, and then I go and disrupt a gambling den, and somebody clearly just found the lighting color slider and is having a good time with it. I like how there are three runic buttons in this room, but I can't use any of them as my stats are too low. Another example of encouraging you to return with a team, because it's unlikely any one player would have the stats for all three buttons. We defend a box from Kobold and another awesome discovery. Because the game is action combat and not tab target, projectile weapons aren't just graphical, they're actual physical in-game projectiles. This means if an enemy uses a ranged attack, like an arrow or a magical spell, not only can you dodge it, you can also intercept into it, so I'm diving in front of spells to tank the damage to protect the cargo, which feels great. After protecting crates, the exact opposite. I now have 10 minutes to go and find and smash 50 crates, and in a great touch, there are way more than 50 in this level, so you're not stuck hunting for the last one, just smash as you go. I then find a Kyber pamphlet, and I give it a read, and it's just a paragraph about how much money he has and how much he hates a guy called Yugi. This chest is trapped, and the trap actually does substantial damage to me, which I love because it makes rogues even more relevant, and now I've got some better armor. But here's an annoying touch, another example of a small but noticeable rough edge. While inside a tavern, your minimap, or world map doesn't update to show that you're inside a tavern. You still see the city that you're in, so there's no tavern navigation specifically. I know this place isn't big enough to need a minimap to navigate around. I mean, you can pretty much just see everything in the room at the same time, but it would be nice to have. This dungeon is a challenge. It needs me to retrieve a gem while killing fewer than six kobold leaders, so I just run past them. But if you alert too many, you trigger a yellow alert, which makes enemies swarm you and just wreck me so I'll need to find a rogue friend and come back for this. I double back to the Druid Grove from earlier, and Google tells me this is indeed an adventure pack, the Gatekeeper's Grove, and I think I got this for free with the code, and it's aimed at low levels, so I'll try it later. More city quests and sewer puzzles, underwater gates, hidden tunnels, and now I have the Paladin ability Lay on Hands, which you can use on yourself, so after a fight I can just give myself a hearty healing slap. This quest has me fighting next to a bunch of explosive barrels, so I'm encouraged to watch my sword swings, and the Butcher's Path challenge has me fight a ton of enemies. But then my equipped weapon tooltip just 
just stops being there. I curse her over to see how much durability my weapon has left, and the game's like, no. No, you don't get this anymore. Unexpected underwater pipe spike trap keeps me on my toes, and then an interesting mechanic. Ooze enemies will break your weapons super quickly, unless your weapon is made of wood. Also, if you attack them with a slashing weapon, there's a chance they'll split into more oozes, which I did not know, so I accidentally create a small ooze army and then break all of my things. This dude wants some taxes collected, so we break into a guy's house and fight his mechanical guard, and then this girl wants a book collected, so we break into this guy's house and fight his magical library, complete with lightning room and fog floor. There's a chest in a magical blue shield at the end of this dungeon which I can't access because I don't have the skills and then we're off to the sewer again because the town is 90% sewer. Some kidnapped kids have been taken to the waterworks so we go and look for them and I join the DDO discord and ask genuinely what are the strengths and weaknesses of this game because I want to hear from longtime players because I can tell that there's quality here it's just hiding beneath a layer of grime. The answers I get are pretty much what I'm assuming. The build variety, encouraging experimentation, and the reincarnation system make it endlessly replayable at every level, but the learning curve is way too steep, and the game almost assumes that you're already good at it when you start playing. I check the wiki for the best adventure pack order, and it recommends I start with the Seal of Chantokor, started in the market, so I give it a go. I also notice that NPCs with a single chalice above their heads give a single one-shot quest, and NPCs with three chalices start a longer adventure line. This leads to the steam tunnels, a massive 3D maze, and here's another thing I have to praise. The ladder climbing animation has actually got the hand positioning correct. You may climb two rings at once because you're a big dragonborn, but I'm really impressed they got that spot on. And then I'm questioning, how can you pay this much attention to detail, but your email sign-up system doesn't allow for two games with the same email? Get shot at while underwater, find the biggest tile puzzle yet, and then die to a magical glowy ball skeleton. And I've still not updated my death respawn point, so we're back on Korthos again. By now, I think I've seen enough, and despite its numerous flaws, I think I've found one of my new favourite games. DDO is undeniably flawed, but at its core it's an adventure game, a traditional Dungeons & Dragons adventure game with traps and loot and a Dungeon Master voiceover narration. It's full of choices and builds, it's got the reincarnation system to start again and keep content relevant to every level, it's got repetitive dungeons filled with side rooms and hidden secrets, it's got floating grass and flying airships, it's a Dungeon Master who's fudging rolls, a character sheet stained with a tea ring, a set of old dice in a cracked leather pouch, it's a dog-eared copy of your favourite fantasy book with the pages folded over, a wizard who needs to shower more, a bard who's on their phone whenever it's not their turn. It's a blanket of mistakes and issues thrown over a foundation of brilliance and choice, and ultimately, it's fun. And while playing it, I had fun. I read the skills, I followed the quests, I solved the puzzles, and sometimes I got caught in the traps, and once I'd played enough to finish the video, I just played some more. So to celebrate that fact, I went out to the shop, and bought myself a little dragonborn paladin model, who now sits on my desk. So to end this review, I will award Dungeons & Dragons Online 3.5, with a plus 4 modifier, and advantage, and proficiency, and favoured game bonus, and flanking advantage, and inspiration, and added smite damage, re-rolling all misses, and critting on a 19, not a 20 out of 10. Cheers for watching. Another massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon, Twitch, and YouTube who keep the channel alive. You can support from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter, and our Discord. And as always, have a great day.